Good morning. We're one week past Easter. And Jesus, in his resurrection, continues to show himself to his disciples. His purpose is so that they would see him and believe. A portion of scripture that we want to look at this morning is found in John chapter 20, verse 19 through the end of the chapter. It's interesting to me how Jesus appears to the various individuals whom he loves so very deeply. He shows himself that he is the risen Lord. Like Lazarus, his friend whom he raised from the dead, whom people could see and feel and touch and hear and see, there was a need for the people to feel the same about him. And so he showed himself in his many different in as many different ways as he possibly could from the day of resurrection we have jesus showing himself to mary to some of the disciples to the two that were walking to the road to amos he appeared to them and walked with them told them about what the old testament had to say that he was supposed to suffer die and then rise again on the third day it was only when they broke bread together that their eyes were opened and they saw him for who he was. And immediately he was gone and they ran all the way back to the rest of the disciples to tell them the good news. It's fascinating to me that Jesus says to the women, go tell the other disciples that I will see them and also Peter. Peter, who felt the shame of his denial, was singled out by Jesus to show that he cared about him very deeply and that Jesus still knew him and still called him by name. It's amazing to me how God does that for us. In the scripture that we're going to share this morning, it's exactly one week from the resurrection. So it's a fitting place for us to continue our journey of Jesus' revelation of himself to his disciples. And John records this event this way. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit, for you for if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And when he, then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, 
which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I think sometimes we're a lot like Thomas. Seeing is believing. I don't know how many times I've heard people say that to me. And it's hard to retort. Seeing is believing. But really what they're saying is, I'm not sure I can trust you. I'm not sure I can trust your testimony. I see in this dialogue and this interaction between Jesus and his disciples, that very thing, that lack of trust, if you would. Think of it a minute. The women came and told. John saw the empty tomb. Peter saw the empty tomb. The two from the road to Emmaus, they had a physical, visible encounter with Jesus and their testimony was recorded. And yet here we find the disciples one week later, the next, what is our Sunday, they're gathered together, pondering probably what is going on, what has been happening, who has been saying what. Notice what it says, for fear of the Jews, they locked the door for fear of the Jews. The word was out. The soldiers who had kept guard had been disseminating the story that the disciples had come and overpowered them and had stolen the body of Jesus. Is it any wonder that they were in fear because the Roman garrison could suddenly be upon them and they would be thrown into jail? Worse, they could well be tortured, tried, and executed in a similar manner with the thieves, with Jesus. They were afraid. You know, I've heard people make a big thing about their fear, but their fear was real. And we can never discount real fear. There's imaginary fear and there's real fear. They had real fear. They understood the times. And they knew that there was always a potential. And while they were pondering, while they were together, and it's only the 11 in this case, and maybe some of the women were not told that, but some of the other texts seem to indicate that, Jesus suddenly appeared. He has come in his resurrection body, that body which he has created for you and I to inhabit. When we finish with this life, we lay down this tent, this mortality, and we pick up that new house made by the hand of God, which Paul later writes to the church of Corinth. New body. Jesus was suddenly there. And his first words are, peace be with you. Shalom. Let God's presence soothe and calm your hearts and your fears. Scripture says, perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love. In that moment, they heard those words of peace. They knew they were loved of God. His presence so filled them that their hearts were quieted. Their nerves were stilled. And what did he do? He proved that he was who he said he was. He showed them his hands 
his feet, his side. Those wounds which he carries in eternity as the Lamb of God who has been slain for the sins of the world, for the sin of the world. Oh, I can imagine they're rejoicing. I can imagine their jubilation. Here is Jesus, whom they've walked with and talked with, suddenly being in their midst. But Thomas wasn't there. And Thomas is a lot like us. How much of a witness do we really need before we'll truly believe? How much of a witness will, do we really need before we will trust? How much do we need to do in order to feel safe and secure in somebody else's word and testimony about things? I can remember when I was doing my leadership course, one of the things we did in, in our leadership courses, we did team training and team exercises. And one of the team exercises was to be harnessed in and then climb and walk across a ladder and, and jump from one place to the other. And the thing was that you were to trust those on the ground that they would hold you. One of the exercises we did to help with trust was that we would get up just a couple of feet off the ground and we'd let go and fall back to see that what we were harnessed to would hold us. Makes a huge difference when we know that there's something there. And Thomas, having walked with these men, having talked to them, having ate with them, having slept by their sides and endured all of the different things, seen all of these miracles, still says, unless I see, unless I see. His doubt is not really misplaced, but is really an indictment of many of us. Unless I see, unless I experience. You know, I've always said, can you see the wind? You feel it. You know the direction it's coming from. Remember the old trial thing we used to do as kids when we lick our finger like this and hold it up and we knew which way the wind was blowing by what side of my finger was the coldest and then I would know but that's like that with Jesus he says to Thomas at the end of his revelation of himself to Thomas, he said, Blessed are those who believe who have not seen. But they've held up their finger and they have allowed the breath of God to blow across their heart and their life. And they know the reality of Jesus because he comes to dwell in our hearts by faith. Let go. God is there. God is there. Let go. Trust the testimony of your friends. Trust the testimony of those around you. Trust those who have experienced his presence already. Trust them in their words. Jesus is alive. And he will come and inhabit your heart and your life. 
and he will make his presence known to you. We can all be like Thomas, but the final word here is these things were written so that you may know that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that having believed, you will have eternal life. Eternal life is only in Jesus. It's not in anything else. We have to receive him into our heart. We have to acknowledge his presence in our lives. We have to acknowledge he wants to be in fellowship with us. He wants to speak these words to you today. Peace be with you. My peace I leave you, not as the world gives you, do I give you peace, be with you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the testimony of those who have gone before, the surety of your presence, of your resurrection, of your eternal life, and your ability to give us all that we need. You are always present. You hear our hearts cry. When you stood in Thomas's presence, you immediately spoke to him of the need that he had voiced to his friends. Unless I see. And you let him see. So, Father, I just pray that each one of us would just trust you in the same way, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.